Bem-vindas e bem-vindos à disciplina Origem das Espécies, de Charles Darwin, ministrada para estudantes de graduação do Instituto de Biociências e Pós-Graduação da USP, neste ano 2 da pandemia da Covid-19. Welcome to the class, The Origin of Species by Charles Darwin, offered, by, offered at the Institute of Bioscience of the University of São Paulo, for undergrad and graduate students in this year two of the COVID-19 pandemic. É uma honra e um enorme privilégio apresentar a vocês uma das mais notórias historiadoras da biologia da atualidade, a professora Janet Brown, do Departamento de História da Ciência da Universidade de Harvard. It's a real honor and a privilege to introduce you one of the most notorious historians of biology today, Professor Janet Brown from the Department of History of Science at Harvard University. O, o grande número de pessoas que ela atraiu para esse webinar às 8 da manhã já diz o quanto a sua vasta obra é conhecida entre nós. Então eu só vou destacar a sua participação em projetos como The Complete Writings of Charles Darwin Online e o Darwin Correspondence Project, que possibilitam a expansão de estudos sobre Darwin em todo o mundo. Uh, the large number of people Janet Brown attracted to this web webinar at 8 o'clock already says how much her vast work is known among us. So I'm just going to highlight her participation in those big projects, the complete writings of Charles Darwin online and Darwin Correspondence Project which allow the expansion of studies on Darwin around the world. É obrigatório ainda que eu mencione ao menos um dos seus livros, uh, uh, esta inusitada biografia, inusitada porque é uma biografia de um objeto, o livro A Origem das Espécies, publicada uh, no Brasil em 2007 pela Zahara. It is mandatory that I mention at least one of her books. This unusual biography, unusual because it is the biography of an object, the book, The Origin of Species, published here in 2007 by Zahara Editores. Antes de passar a palavra, vou dar algumas instruções. Uh, I just take a few more minutes to make some announcements. Durante a palestra, uh, os microfones ficarão silenciados. Uh, ao final da apresentação, se você quiser fazer uma pergunta, por favor, levante a mão clicando no ícone no pé da página do Google Meet. Eu chamarei pela ordem e quando for a sua vez, abra o microfone e a câmera e faça uma só pergunta, por favor. Notem que o evento está sendo gravado. During the lecture, mute your microphone. At the end of the presentation, if you want to ask a question, raise your hand by clicking on the icon at the bottom of the Google Meet page. I will call in order and when it's your turn, open the microphone and the camera and ask one single question, please. Note that the meeting is recorded. Uh, a palestra será de cerca de uma hora e abordará os primeiros escritos de Darwin. The lecture will last about an hour and will cover Darwin's early writings. Com isso, acho que já falei mais do que devia, então vamos às boas-vindas à nossa convidada. With that, I think I have said more than enough. So join me to welcome our guest, Professor Janet Brown. Please, Professor. No, your microphone is still unmuted. You have to, yeah, okay. okay. Okay, thank you very much indeed for this wonderful introduction and hello to everybody who is listening. Uh, I am afraid I have to speak in English. I am not as talented as you being able to go back and forth into the two languages. I apologize for that. I'm very happy to join you in this series of talks about Darwin and Darwinism. I want to say thank you to Maria. Um, it's very nice for me to see her again, but 
in these unfortunate COVID circumstances. And to the organizers and to Marcello, who is going to help me with the um, illustrations. So I've been asked to speak about Darwin's first writings. And by this, we usually mean the notebooks and the first drafts of his two essays on evolution by natural selection. And I am going to talk about these, but when we, when we use the phrase Darwin's first writings, we tend to think that we are going to be uh, engaging in a conversation about the origins and development of his evolutionary thinking. And I do want to do this, but because we're very lucky as historians that Darwin wrote so much of his thinking down in ink on paper, sometimes pencil on paper, I plan to expand the topic a little to include not just Darwin's ideas, but also the material culture of the documents. And these documents themselves, the actual objects, the notebooks, the essay, the manuscripts, have become reified over the years and celebrated as vehicles for insights into Darwin's mind. And this interests me. So I think I wish to speak a little bit about Darwin as a writer and what that might mean to us as historians. And I wish to go into my PowerPoint. So give me one moment whilst I negotiate the screens. Share. And then I want to do. Hmm. Slideshow. Okay, full stop. So here is something that's very familiar to you. And uh, I've just explained that one of the things I would like to cover is Darwin's, the way that Darwin's writings become physical. And the shape of my talk today, whilst we're covering his ideas, will also address three um, questions or three points about Darwin in his early life. Darwin as a recorder of nature, the way that he began to write privately, which of course is the notebooks, and the way that he then began to write for an audience, which we could construe the two longer essays that he wrote in the 1840s as writing for an audience. And how are we going to do this? I want to go right back to the beginning, give you a little biographical detail, of course. Um, Darwin, as a recorder of nature, Darwin as someone who wrote down his findings, began as a child, but more specifically when he went to Edinburgh University as a young man, he was only 16 and 17 when he went to Edinburgh. Uh, he was registered for only a few courses at the time and spent most of his uh, free time with the scholar, the naturalist Robert Grant, who you see here, a very uh, avant-garde thinker who encouraged Darwin to contemplate reproductive processes in marine invertebrates, seaweeds, and such such things. Um, here is a an extract from Darwin's first notebook, the one we don't really talk about, which is his Edinburgh notebook. And some little diagrams shows that he illustrates, he wrote down what he was seeing. And in a moment, I think we'll want to explore together the meaning that historians can put into the operation of writing things down. You'll recall Bruno Latour talks about this as inscription. It's a way of making biological or any kind of natural phenomena, turning natural phenomena into information that can be handled by writing it down. <laughs> 
Edinburgh was amazingly interesting for Darwin, but his father did take him away <coughs> from the university. He clearly wasn't doing much good there. He didn't wish to pursue medicine as a career. And Darwin's father sent him to Cambridge University in England to study for the church. It was a, a degree program that required him to read theology and a number of classical texts, um, some mathematics, and very specifically Paley, na Paley's natural theology that we will talk about in a moment, um, which he did, but rather ineffectually. And he spent most of his time pursuing beetles. He collected beetles instead. He read very widely in the natural historical materials of the day and collected beetles and wrote about them. This very attractive little caricature was drawn by a friend uh, and it's, if you can see, it says under the left hand one, Darwin on his hobby. It's Darwin sitting on a beetle with a collecting net in his hand um, with the old fashioned English Victorian hat, hat on his head. And the one on the right says, go it, Charlie. So his reputation as a young man was as a very enthusiastic naturalist, um, actually rather well trained in many ways, but mostly self-trained. Uh, he was not in any way a um, promising scholar. And the thing that changed all this, as you will know, you will know, everybody knows, that the Beagle voyage an opportunity that was extraordinary, even in his own period, the Beagle voyage changed Darwin in, ex in very material ways and gave him a path in life that he perhaps had thought about, but nevertheless, it gave him the, inf the um, equipment he needed to become a naturalist of the highest order. None of this was really clear when he first uh, joined the Beagle. And I want to spend a little time, although it's not exactly um, dwelling on his notebooks, I want to spend a moment talking about the Beagle voyage and how it helped him both, of course, in a um, way of uh, developing his mind, but also in developing the persona that he had for the rest of his life, which was to write things down. Here we have a picture of the Beagle, the ship. Um, it's one of the only contemporary illustrations we have. There's three or four others, but this is quite a pretty one. Taken a little later in the ship's life on, the, uh, la on a later voyage in uh, Sydney, Australia. Here is Charles Darwin in the middle, uh, 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 one of the earliest known images of him, not exactly contemporary with the Beagle voyage. It was taken a few years after the Beagle voyage and actually commemorates his marriage in 1840. But it's the only one we have that roughly shows us what he looked like during those earlier years. And on the right, we have Robert Fitzroy, who was the captain of the Beagle, who invited Darwin in a roundabout way to join the ship in 1831 and uh, was Darwin's companion and for many, many of the months of the voyage, Darwin's friend. Together they discussed things, they talked about the geology of the voyage, they wrote letters to each other if they were separated during the voyage, and Fitzroy undertook to land Darwin in many of the places in South America that they were visiting in order for Darwin to make explorations. And then Fitzroy would pick him up again at some another port or another bay, and together they traveled the world. There's much discussion in scholarly circles about that relationship. And if one looks at many of the dramatic reconstructions of the voyage, 
they are usually put into counterpoint of Darwin as the secular scientific thinker and Fitzroy the conservative, uh, very religious thinker. And those positions, I'm sure, are absolutely true interpretations of the older men. But when you read the correspondence and the other documents that were written during the voyage, you find that they got along pretty well for five years. And it was only afterwards that their points of view became very um, um, opposed in, in many ways. And they personally were never opposed, but they didn't see much of each other after the voyage ended. As you will know, Darwin collected, of course, he felt that that was what he was asked to do on the voyage. He collected rather more than one might have expected, given the terms of the invitation. He was extraordinarily diligent. Comprehensive collections were made. They were all sent back to England. They were stored for him. And then Darwin's intention was to distribute them after his return to the museums and uh, learned societies in Great Britain so that other people would classify and announce his results. He saw himself as only the first person in this process of collecting and distributing information. He kept some of the marine invertebrates, he kept the barnacles for himself to look at, and he found that it was very difficult to get anyone to look at the plants after he returned. Uh, so they, they stayed in storage for quite some time, but mostly this collection was what Darwin perceived as the vehicle for making him a naturalist, for helping him to become a learned person. Principally, his major uh, thinking was geological, and I will speak about that in just one moment. So here we are on the Beagle. Darwin is miles away from home. He is alone on the ship, well, he's with 90 other people, and he has a task, which is to collect. So he learnt from the captain and from his university days to record everything, not just once, but multiple times. So one can imagine him going out into the field with a notebook where he uh, n noted the various things that he needed to note, especially where and when and what he was collecting. On back the board ship, or sometimes if he was in a camp on shore, he would make lists of what he had collected according to the family in which they belonged. Uh, he wrote a journal which we can compare roughly to the captain's logbook. He wrote zoological notes about the environments, the habitats, the behaviors that he had seen. He particularly took interest in the birds and had a separate set of notes for the birds. He had botanical notes, he had geological notes, he drew diagrams. And on top of all of this, he wrote letters home, both to to his family, of course, but to his um, professors and to his friends about the things that he was seeing. So here we have a little montage of the kinds of documents that he was engaging with. Why is this important? In modern historiographical circles, you will know that there's a lot of interest in what's generally called the archive about writing, what it can mean to us as historians. And here I want to draw your attention to, of course, the fact that writing down everything as a record is extraordinarily helpful to us as historians. He didn't do it for us, he did it for him, but we're very lucky that it has been 
for the most part, all preserved. And then the writing for Darwin was a um, expression of his intention to, to use this information in order to make his life um, as a naturalist become possible. And here, are, and the second last two things on this screen, I just want to um, pause over. Writing in this way as somebody who was discovering or exploring, uh, processing information tends to obscure the many, many people who gave him information or who helped him. In his letters home and in his journal, he sometimes said this person or that person gave him information. He often has the name, but it's clear from the way that this information is recorded that Darwin had a 19th century vision of himself as collecting information in the same way as he was collecting specimens, that once they were collected, they were his. And that information was his to use in whatever way he felt was appropriate. And we will know that this is something very typical of the elite in um, his historical terms. It's very typical of the educated elite who come from the West and uh, travel in areas that are unknown to them, but extremely well known to the people who live there. So my last point is that writing in this way, it's useful for us to think about it, not all the time, but occasionally, to think about Darwin's writing on the Beagle Voyage as a colonizing process it's a sort of appropriation of the things that he was seeing that would then be turned into a system that was entirely appropriate for Darwin, but was not in any way um, developed by the people from whom he was gathering information. And this cartoon, in a way, reflects some of those proposals. It's very recently discovered. The origin of this cartoon has been, uh, or at least the, the illustrator, and whether it's real, whether it's genuine, have been discussed. I personally feel it is a genuine contemporary illustration of Darwin on board the ship. And as you see, um, here is Darwin in the center um, it's a cartoon, so he is dressed in civilian clothes and has this Victorian hat on his head that signifies that is Darwin. In case we don't know that it's Darwin, it's in the caption down below. Um, and all the sailors on the Beagle, possibly they are visually likened to the real sailors, but we have no way of knowing that. The sailors are all bringing material, natural material to Darwin. And in these balloons above their head, they're all saying things along the lines of, is this big enough for you, sir? Is this what you want? Here you are, sir. And you'll see there's many different kinds of object that is that are being brought to him. And the reason I show this is because it's kind of fun. But also, it, sh it shows that even in the very act of getting materials, collecting, it wasn't just Darwin with a net or a trap. It was many people helping him collect the materials. This is rather similar to the situation in Humboldt's life. Um, other explorers too, but I just bring Humboldt into the story because he was such an influence on Darwin. And there has been a very remarkable paper, several remarkable papers, about Humboldt's use of local knowledge systems that we shouldn't now think of Humboldt as a solitary 
explorer, as a single heroic genius, that much of the um, information that he gathered was from local born experts. And I think Darwin was the same. And I think we, um, as, as we go forward, thinking in historical terms about Darwin, that's a very useful um, aspect to keep in mind. So Darwin traveled on the Beagle. He had many people helping him. Uh, he had Humboldt in his mind. He also had Charles Lyell in his mind. Um, you will be familiar with Lyell's book, The Principles of Geology. Darwin drew many, many um, practical things from this book and many theoretical things from this book. He had no reason um, to criticize the, the comments that Lyell was making and Darwin absorbed the whole of the Lyellian system completely and was enormously interested in thinking about gradual change in geological terms and about the alterations between level between the sea and um, and the land all of which came out in his later geological <clears throat> writings but influenced his theoretical proposals on um, evolution quite strongly so there's Humboldt there's there's Lyle and Famously, there's the Finches, the three things, four things that helped Darwin turn towards thinking about transmutation, as you will know, are the geology, geology, uh, the fossils that he disclosed in the voyage, the distribution, geographical distribution of the, um, the rhea, over the Patagonian plains, there are two kinds of rhea, and they're mutually exclusive in geographical terms. And Darwin was one of the first people to actually document that. It had been proposed before, but he documented it. So there's the rhea, and also the finches or the animals of the Galapagos archipelago. The tortoises, the birds, the mockingbirds uh, were collected by Darwin, plants were collected by Darwin, and as he was traveling back on, from, from the islands across the Pacific and then the Atlantic to England, he wrote several very uh, tentative remarks in his ornithological notes about how interesting these distribution patterns were in the Galapagos archipelago. So he was, as many people know, not really an evolutionist by the time he arrived back in Great Britain in 1836, but he had certainly had many speculative and engaged thoughts about what these animals, birds, plants, rocks could be telling about the history of life on earth and one of the first things that he did when he returned uh, now we're talking about post beagle times was to distribute his specimens as i've already already suggested and uh, give these all the birds not just the finches all the birds to john gould the uh, um, uh, taxonomist who was very prestigious at the time and Gould identified the, the finches in particular as individual species <coughs> excuse me that were distributed across the islands in particular patterns the finches appeared to Darwin to be very closely related and he made that extraordinary step of thinking to himself that perhaps one kind of finch or maybe two or three kinds of finch had arrived on the island on the archipelago and had diversified according to the conditions 
according to the food that they needed to eat, the shape of their beaks needed to adapt to the food that they would eat. And that these were not just varieties, as he had initially thought, but these were true species, as Gould told him. And it's that, Frank Soloway writes about this in great detail, it's that moment that encourages Darwin to really tackle the notion of transmutation, how interesting this could be, he thinks to himself, and he opens up a series of notebooks. So the notebooks as physical objects um, are exactly the same as the ones that he had as field notebooks on the Beagle. He possibly bought another box full of them. They have leather covers. They're uh, the size of, gosh, none of you will remember what a DVD looks like, but they're about, they're about six inches, by, or as we do centimeters now, they're about 10 centimeters by five centimeters. And Darwin had a number of them. He actually, um, or at least now in the libraries, we have about 10 of these that, in, that have his private thoughts in them. There are others that are the field notebooks. And here we have uh, one called B. He had eight that he labeled A, B, C, D, E, uh, M and N for different topics. Uh, he had a notebook that he listed all the books that he wanted to read. And then he had another notebook that said books that he had read. And you would have thought that he could have just crossed them off, but he didn't. He, he tabulated the books that he had read that were separate from the books to be read. Um, and there are others that have been very closely studied. This is a major part of the Darwin industry, the Darwin history, what's in these notebooks, they express an amazing fertility of ideas, creativity. You can see an individual working through uh, all kinds of hypotheses, rejecting many of them, making um, records of conversations, none of it in a coherent manner. They're very jumbled. And here we have the B notebook opened in um, July 1837. The ship returned in October 1836. So within six months, Darwin had already filled an, an A notebook. And here he is opening a B notebook just after John Gould had told him about the finches being species, not varieties. And uh, very famously, there's this little diagram. It's quite early, this little diagram. It's on page 36, you'll see in the notebook. Um, and Darwin clearly was thinking through what a transmutationary history of living forms might look like. And here we have, uh, if you can see at the ends of the branches, there's A, B, C, D representing particular groups we don't know what was in his mind, but we could postulate one's birds, one's reptiles, one's fish, one's primates, and that they're all related in a common stem. And the text, if you can see it, it says, thus between A and B, um, there, there is gap, gaps, gap of relation. Some scholars, and I think very rightly, have suggested we look at this in the wrong, we are looking at this image in the wrong way. We're looking at it from our perspective as an evolutionary tree, and that perhaps it would be more accurate to think of it not so much as an evolutionary tree, but as a map of the way extinction can create relationships. So, if you can imagine not looking at the lines, but looking at the gaps, the spaces in between the lines, that 
is really what Darwin may have been thinking about, about how extinction of particular sets of species crafts relationships in the current day. It's very exciting to think about it like that. It's um, quite different. This image, as you will know, has been about for decades and is um, completely commodified. You can find it tattooed onto people's ankles as if it were a tree of life. It may be a tree of death, which I think is rather an exciting thought. So we have Darwin's notebooks. And in these notebooks, he was exploring very many ideas. He went back through his grandfather's notions. He went through all the breeders' uh, works that he could do, that he could get hold of. He read very widely in metaphysics and uh, ethics and other kinds of works. Principally, his theory of evolution by natural selection emerged from his understanding of what William Paley had stipulated, a book that Darwin read carefully. The natural theology argued that the designs, the adaptations that you see in species um, were designed by God in order to fit those organisms into their place in nature. Paley argued that all things show design, all designed things have a designer, they must have a designer, and therefore the, the universe has a designer and we may call this person God. Um, very straightforward, very attractive. Scholar, students who read it today find it very attractive. It seems perfectly reasonable if you're a relatively unsophisticated thinker. Um, Darwin found it attractive too and was very interested in the origin of adaptations, as we might call it, the origin of variations. And Paley had provided an answer that they're designed by God. Darwin went on to explore alternative explanations. And as he was exploring those alternative explanations, he came across the essay by Robert Malthus on population, um, very popular in its day. Uh, Darwin was reading, not this edition in 1789, he was reading probably the sixth edition that was published in the 1830s in England. And Malthus had a very simple argument as well, a numerical argument that uh, we know it's not correct, but it was thought to be correct in his day that the population is kept in balance with the means of feeding it subsistence so that there were checks, Malthus imagined, checks to the size of the population, to, the, to population growth. And those checks fell on the poorer elements of society with famine, misery, vice, disease, and that those people would die and the population would remain at a broadly stable number. Um, we can see nowadays that Malthus was thinking in as if the classes, of the, the social classes of Great Britain were almost hermetically sealed and um, he, he didn't allow for many of the factors that we now do. And Malthus believed <clears throat> that this situation was designed by God in order to keep populations at a uh, reasonable level. Darwin read it and famously saw in Malthus's statistics the notion that competition selection would fall on those organisms that were plentiful and that the most successful ones would be the ones who survived. And here we just have a very simple schematic um, story about what's, what was Darwin's first 
theory of evolution by natural selection. He calls it descent with modification. He amalgamated ideas drawn from William Paley, an idea drawn from Thomas Malthus, and a framework from Charles Lyell, and recognized that the more adapted, adapted organisms would be the ones to survive the struggle. That's his theory in a nutshell. That's why we think the notebooks are so marvelous. You can see somebody arriving at a remarkable theory. This theory was entirely secular, and Darwin knew that it would be provocative and controversial. All of this work was done in London, but in the 1840s, 1842, Darwin had married, he had a couple of children, and he decided to move into the countryside of England. He went to uh, Kent, which is just south of London, nice for a day trip nowadays. Uh, this house is currently a museum of for Darwin. Uh, here it is in a contemporary drawing, very beautiful in the summer. And you can see it's quite late in Darwin's life. Um, under the veranda on the left, you can see a very small figure in black talking to a child with a sun hat and a dog on the path. Um, that's popularly supposed to be a representation of Darwin sitting in the sunshine in his house in Kent. We have to remember that Darwin came from a very prosperous family. He had no need of a job. He had private income. His father had made it over to him um, as a trust fund. First of all, when he came back from the Beagle and then secondly, when he got married, he was a wealthy man. He had many children, which made him worry that he would not have wealth enough to um, give the same kind of benefits to his own children. But he, man he managed just fine. Uh, it, it was a time of high profits for the elite investors of the 19th century. And Darwin invested very carefully, and very well. Um, just as an aside, his investment books and his financial records reflect just the same care in recording and tabulating and working things out as his natural history writings. He was a man who liked to catalogue things, I think we could say. Um, so here Darwin moves to this home in Kent where he lived for the rest of his life and turned it into the place in which he manufactured his theories. Um, the house ran around, the, the uh, um, arrangements of the household circulated around Darwin. Um, he established a very extensive correspondence network so that he didn't have to be in London all the time talking to friends. And he gathered in the information, again, in writing from correspondence that stre ultimately stretched all over the globe. Principally were his English friends, um, and several of these were uh, noted. Charles Lyell became a close friend, and Joseph Hooker from Kew Gardens became a close friend. Here, in what Darwin regarded as peace and quiet, gathering information, writing it down, processing it, filing it. He came to develop these ideas, the notebook ideas, he developed in 1842 into an essay, or he called it a sketch, um, a first pencil sketch, he called it. And here we are on the right hand side, you can see the final page in pencil, that's why it's so faint, of what he believed. Such are my reasons for believing that specific forms are not immutable. It's a very difficult sketch for us to reprint in modern form. Um, one of Darwin's sons, Francis Darwin, did attempt to do this, 
during the Darwin uh, centenary celebrations in 1909, and he called it the foundations of the origin of species. That's a retrospective vision of what this first pencil sketch was attempting to do. Darwin was still not completely sure about his theory. Uh, we will know, it is 1842, he had another 20 years to go, more or less, certainly 15, before he felt confident enough to publish. This was a private sketch. He didn't show it to anyone. He scribbled it out in pencil to make sure that he had on paper the full shape of the theory as it existed in his head in 1842. And then on the left, you can see um, the first kind of um, the, the paper cover of this sketch. It's in Darwin's handwriting, uh, but it's later. A first pencil sketch of species theory written at Mare, which was his wife's family home, and Shrovesbury, which is his father's family home, during May and June 1842. And then there's a few library markings down at the bottom. Um, so this was a big step for him. Here he had a first pencil sketch of his theory. But again, I have to stress this was private. What did he do next? Well, he developed it and he began writing as if someone might read it. And here, this is the third of my three categories, Darwin as a recorder of nature, Darwin as a private writer and thinker, and here we've got writing for an audience. Darwin developed that 1842 sketch into a longer piece of work that we now call the essay. Um, in fact, Darwin calls it a sketch, but it's uh, so difficult. We have to be completely clear. That's why we always say the date afterwards. So this is the essay of 1844, quite a big affair. Um, in, uh, he, had it, he paid for it to be copied out neatly and it runs to about 120 pages of handwriting. This essay of 1844 has very minor differences from the 1842. Um, the essay of 1844 presents a theory that is the antecedent to what we see in the origin of species, but there are some material differences. This was the first draft of his theory in extenso. Several scholars, including Jonathan Hodge, have very carefully compared the uh, philosophical commitments and statements in this 1844 document, the philosophical commitments in Darwin's longer manuscript that he began 10 years later in 18. 55, 1856, and what's in the origin of species. And there's some very interesting shifts. We mustn't think of Darwin as having got it in 1844 and then sat around waiting to be surprised by Alfred Russell Wallace and then write the origin of species. He was developing this theory all along. He was anxious about it. And one of the extraordinary things about Darwin's essay of 1844 that indicates that he was thinking of making this public, but we can see in uh, many ways how ambivalent he was about it. He knew it was controversial. So he wrote a letter to his wife, almost like a will and testament, the letter was tucked away with the essay, um, giving his wife instructions what to do with it should he die. Um, he may have imagined that he would die unexpectedly. He was at that time 
often quite ill. And he may have simply been cautious, feeling that this was such an important idea that he didn't wish it to get lost. So that he specified to his wife, uh, here are the first, here's the first sentence of that letter. It's a long letter. Uh, my dear Emma, I've just finished my sketch of my species theory. We have to realize his wife knew that he was writing on species origins. If, as I believe that my theory is true, and if it be accepted, even by one competent judge, it will be a considerable step in science. What a prescient remark that was, just extraordinary. And he went on in this handwritten letter to his wife to say that he would like her to take 400 English pounds from his estate if he died and give it to somebody who would edit and publish this piece of writing. And he names the five people who he thinks would be good editors, all of whom were friends of his. They were people he trusted. They're not necessarily people who were avowed transmutationists, if in fact only um, one of them was, but they were people he trusted to be scholarly and reliable and that they would make sure that his sketch came to public view with all the footnotes and bibliographies that he had not put in it. So he was asking his wife to find somebody who would um, pretty the piece up, give it references and find a publisher and get it published. And the little clip underneath from um, the manuscript, I've taken it off the web, which is why it's a little bit fuzzy, um, is the first page, it says table of contents, part one, on the variation of organic beings under domestication and in their natural state. And we who have read the origin will recognize this as the um, a, a, a contracted version of what would become chapters one and two in the origin of species. So the five people that he asked his wife to address, uh, I give you the names just for the sake of the record, uh, were Charles Lyell, one of Darwin's closest friends at that point, who knew a little bit about his transmutationary ideas. Edward Forbes, who people don't really know much about nowadays, but was at that time a very highly respected naturalist and paleontologist who had interesting ideas about the history of life. Uh, Hugh Strickland, who was similarly a, a taxonomist, not so much a paleontologist, a taxonomist interested in birds principally, who again had very avant-garde ideas about classification. Darwin had got to know him on a commission, um, a, a committee that was held in London on uh, devising rules for nomenclature. So Hugh Strickland was on the list. Um, Darwin's old professor at Cambridge who had helped him get the invitation to the Beagle voyage and who had uh, been a constant support to him, John Henslow, John Stevens Henslow, the botanist, and lastly, who, the person who was at that point becoming very close indeed to him and went on to become Darwin's best friend, uh, Joseph Dalton Hooker, who worked at Kew Gardens, that was run by his father, the director, William Jackson Hooker. So these were five naturalist friends who Darwin knew 
could be trusted with his ideas that had up until that point uh, been, they'd been private they hadn't been secret but they had been private he had divulged them he had discussed them with a few people not necessarily the whole scheme but bits and pieces from the scheme so a few of his closer friends knew what he was thinking and we must assume his wife also so at the same time uh, just to reinforce the notion that Darwin was cautiously going public, or at least testing the waters. He wrote a book after the Beagle journey on his travels that was called Journal of Researches. The first edition was published pretty soon after he arrived back in 1839. And he had a second edition. John Murray, the publisher, called for a second edition in 1845, and Darwin added to it a number of things, including this remark about the finches, the Galapagos finches. Um, he had an illustration of them, and you can see very clearly the difference in beaks, and that they indeed look like different species of bird, Although Darwin himself felt that they were so similar that they could even be thought of as very marked varieties. And here he says, one might really fancy that from an original paucity of birds in this archipelago, one species had been taken and modified for different ends. He was flying that proposal. And interestingly, nobody noticed it. But we do, retrospectively, because it's his very first public statement about the possibility of transmutationary change. Um, just going back to the essay for a moment, I, uh, coming to my conclusion just, just now, um, this essay was Darwin's um, not his final word, but it was, it summarized what he thought in 1844. And it remained, even though he carried on developing his ideas and even writing different parts of a new book from 1856 onwards, when Alfred Russell Wallace contacted Darwin in 1858, and sent him his essay on the transformation of species. Darwin went back to this essay of 1844 to show his friends that he had what has to be called priority. He had shown this essay to a couple of his friends, Lyle and Hooker, uh, not in 1844, but a little later, and when Wallace came to him with, wrote to him with his own essay, Darwin panicked, as we might expect, and asked his friends Lyle and Hooker, I showed you my essay. I would hate to uh, call on my priority, but I, ha I do have priority. I, I wrote this first. I wrote this in 1844. Uh, what shall I do? And Lyle and Hooker, as close friends of Darwin, calmed him down and said that the thing, the only honourable thing to do was to publish Wallace's essay as he requested and to add extracts from Darwin's essay of 1844, which we have here on our screen, add some extracts from this to show that Darwin too had those ideas. This is what happened. Um, this essay of 1844 was sent in the mail to Joseph Hooker in 1858. And Joseph Hooker's wife extracted paragraphs from it, probably with Joseph's help and support and um, 
interest. Extracts from this were made in handwriting by the Hooker family and sent with Wallace's handwritten essay and a copy of a letter that Darwin had written a little more recently to his friend in America, Asa Gray. These three items were sent as a contribution to the Linnaean Society in 1858 for a meeting to be read as an article um, from Charles Darwin and Alfred Russell Wallace introduced to the meeting of the Linnaean Society on the 1st of July 1858 by Charles Lyell and Joseph Hooker. So that's a well-known story. It may be that other people in our series are going to be speaking about it. That announcement in 1858 at the Linnaean Society uh, with neither author present led to Darwin really sitting down and writing the text of On the Origin of Species. He wrote it in 13 months. He abstracted it from a longer essay that he already had, an unfinished um, long volume that he was writing. So the origin was an abstract of a longer volume. And the longer volume and the origin have in it ideas that were not in the essay of 1844. And rather interestingly, the fame that Darwin gained as the author of The Origin of Species in 1859, it obscures this developmental process from the Beagle Voyage, or maybe even we can say from his time at Edinburgh as a 17-year-old. The fame of Darwin as the author of the origin obscures the processual developmental nature of the work that he went through to get to that point. I think it's important for us as historians to try and unpick that process that led, that came to the origin of species to try and look at the events and the writings that he produced from 18, well, really we could do from 18, 18, um, 1830 to 1844, that that was a process of writing, a process of constructing an idea. And that we need to acknowledge the many um, drafts and versions of his ideas that they went through before they came out as the origin of species in 1859. And I've been particularly interested myself in this talk to share with you ideas about how um, this process actually obscures quite a few or nearly all of the people who contributed to Darwin's ideas. And by, back, by getting back to the writing process, I think we can see that the construction of his theory really was a process. And that's where I'd like to leave you today. Thank you very much for listening to me. And I think we're open for questions now. Yes, thank you so much. So wonderful talk, uh, Janet. Uh, we have some questions already. Uh, I would like to, to make the first one from a colleague of us, um, uh, Nelio Bizo, that is a historian of biology and uh, a scholar on Darwin as well. And he, he needed to left the just a few minutes ago because he had his classes, his students waiting for him. But he left uh, with me this question I would um, uh, read for you. Uh, he would like to ask if you think that the defense of irreversibility from extinctions is an important point in the origin of species. 
and that it has been little emphasized by Darwin scholars. Well, what an interesting question. And I am not sure if Darwin himself ever thought too much about this. I think if we formulate it in a different set of words, we call it irreversibility. I think Darwin and Lyle and other people who wrote and discussed extinction were absolutely convinced that extinction meant extinction. And that if something was shown to be still alive, it hadn't gone extinct. So they're looking at it in a rather different way. They, and I'm not sure now whether that exactly was the question. The, the, again, um, if something, if an organism, a successful organism has an adaptation that makes it successful, the argument, I guess, from modern biology is that it doesn't ever go backwards. It's successful. It's, it sticks around. But I think we might imagine that forms like parasites become, um, oh, I'm so sorry. It sounds as if there's a fire alarm. Hey, gee whiz. Would you mind if I can uh, see outside my door? No, of I'm course. You can go, go yes. I hope, I hope everything is okay. Enquanto ela vai, eu tenho duas pessoas inscritas, é isso, para fazer perguntas. Eu estou sem a sequência aqui, Marcelo, acho que aparece para você, né? Okay. Um, excuse me. Isso, tem cinco, I seis think pessoas. I call somebody, excuse me. It's okay? O que, que ela falou? Que que é eu não chamar, consegui alguém? entender também. É, porque a gente... Eu acho que ela, ela falou, falou que ela que tem que ligar para alguém. Isso. Gostei muito, Maria Alice, muito bacana. É, deu um panorama, né? E o inglês eu achei fácil de entender, não é inglês? Esse é um inglês bem britânico, eu estou enganada. É, ela é, ela está trabalhando em Harvard, mas ela foi, foi para lá em 2006, parece. Então, acho que ela é inglesa mesmo. Porque se fosse ela americana, a gente não entenderia. É, depende, I'm né? I'm so da... sorry, who é. would this? Yeah. Thank you. Hello. There's a uh. in the kitchen on the apartment oh. 993 Memorial Drive. Nossa, ela tá com um alarme de incêndio mesmo? I do yes. beg your pardon. I am. I apologize very much. My oh. neighbor's phone was out of battery, so oh. I called the fire. Um, and do you so do you I need to go? This no no. Um, I apologize. The defense no. for irreversibility. No. There's two things. I may have misunderstood. Of course, if something goes extinct, it doesn't come back again. But if something is very well adapted. And the fact that it does not de-adapt is a wonderful defense for Darwin's theory. And I'm not sure that he uses that at any point. I rather think 
um, but my colleague perhaps will forgive me for not knowing for sure that this is a notion that is common enough in modern biology and that we can't expect Darwin to have quite the same idea. Okay, thank you. I will pass now to students. They have um, the first one. Marcelo, please help me. Uh, the, the first Flavio. one is Flavio Ferreira. Flavio, are you there? He got too excited with my fire alarm. <laughs> <laughs> yes, we were. Or he lost, he lost me definitely before. Okay, the second one is João Gabriel. Oh, okay, Flavio. Uh, ah, okay. Uh, Can you hear me? Oh, okay, let's give him his time. Um, it's new, uh, the Christianity movement is popping in the United States. Uh, my guess is, so, yes. This is happening in Europe. Also. I, I will repeat the question. Uh, he's talking about the creationists oh. in the United States. Mm -hmm. They are very known for us. But he's asking about in Europe, are there many creationists as well? Thanks for the question, Flavio. There are some, but not nearly as organized as in the United States. You will perhaps know that America, um, the United States has um, a very strong re um, conviction that religion should be part of their daily lives. And the way that the states organize public education allows for local groups to determine what books are being read and what books are not being read. And the creationists have a very strong uh, presence in those school committees, regulations. They have a very strong presence in the United States. Also on the web, if you've ever had a chance to look at some of the materials on the web, they are very good indeed they manage to be uh, visually exciting interesting they pull up questions that many people feel need an answer so the presence is pronounced in the united states we don't have that in the in england um, we have schools that are uh, based on creation ideas not very many and there are people who make representations in, in the government to remember not everybody believes in evolution, but it's completely different, I would say. Thank you. Europe, Europe I'm less able to, continental Europe, I'm less able to speak about. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, we'll have a, a guest, a guest from uh, US that is Glenn Branch who will, will talk about creationists in America, because this uh, is coming to to an issue in Brazil now. So, so? we have to learn it's how to It's a really fight. interesting issue, both politically and um, socioeconomically. Uh, yes. It's not just about religion. Sure, sure. So the next one? So the next one is João Gabriel. Um, uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay, um, so my name is Gabriel and uh, I would like to make a question, but at first I would like to thank you uh, for this amazing lecture, which I'm honestly uh, thrilled to watch actually. And um, so at page 16 of your book, you say that the combination of certain elements of Darwin's background, such as uh, Niley's social position, uh, religious, uh, skepticism assured him a place in England's high society at the time. You also add at page um, 35 that his grandfather, Erasmus, uh, was an abolitionist 
uh, and so were his, his father, his sisters, uh, cousins, and himself. Uh, so I wonder how religious exactly was the uh, the environment in which he grew up, and uh, also if his family was already considered uh, somewhat radical for the standards of the period of uh, English society at the, at the time? What a nice question, thank you. Um, I would say the family in all its branches was rather well known as being skeptics so that they uh, the women folk went to church, but they went to a church which is called Unitarian that is very low key. And um, the men folk of all generations in that family line didn't go to church. They adopted all the moral conventions of Christianity. They did their duty. They paid their taxes, they uh, kind of uh, did charitable work in the society and supported Abbott. They, some, some of them went into the British Parliament on the side of uh, what they then called radical, that we would now call liberal. So they're secular, but there's a veneer of being conservatively part of the English society. And if you know a little bit about English society, you will know that it's very easy for an English person to believe one thing and then act another thing. Um, <laughs> so that Darwin had, Darwin himself, Charles Darwin, had these amazingly secular thoughts but he was never an atheist and he belonged to all those parts of society where Christianity was talked about all the time. So one might call it hypocritical, but I think probably one can think of it a little more constructively in historical terms by this being a time of sh shifts, major shifts and the conventional um, aspects of British Anglicanism, Christianity, were, were eroding and that the Darwin family and other families were part of that erosion. It's very interesting. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, the next one is Gabriel Vasto. Gabriel. Um, good morning, um, Professor Janet. Um, it's an honor for me to, to listen and to talk with you. Thank you very much. It was a beautiful um, presentation. Um, you, you said um, and you cited it several times during the chapter one of the Origin of Species, a biography that Darwin um, wrote an autobiography, and I didn't know that um, too recently. So I wonder if he has ever written the, the reasons that led him to write an autobiography, or was it a common thing in the 19th century, or there was some event that, you know, inspired Darwin to write? So this is the question, thanks. Thank you, Gabriel, that's a really, fun question for me to answer. I am working exactly on these questions you ask. So there was a reason for Darwin to write, a very personal family-based reason. He had just become a grandfather and you are too young to understand the feelings that the, the, the second generation have for a grandchild was his first grandchild. And so he settled down the summer that his daughter-in-law was pregnant to write about himself and his family and to put down the stories that he had heard as a boy, all these things that he thought would get lost. And again, if one 
forgives me overemphasizing this, he was a man who liked to record things. And he did feel that some of his knowledge about the family would get lost. It was quite common for individuals of a certain class, upper class people mostly, not always, but mostly, to write an autobiography. There's a long tradition of autobiographies in European culture and I'm sure elsewhere that explore the soul and how an individual comes to the ideas that they hold. And Darwin did, wasn't really writing that kind of an autobiography, but he did in the end talk quite a bit about his religious beliefs. And it was something that was meant only for the family. But during the big celebrations in 1909, um, 30 years after Darwin had died, it was a celebration for the publication of The Origin of Species, 1909. His son, Francis, who had had the grandchild, um, published this autobiography. And then later on, it was republished because Francis had left out quite a lot. Francis had left out the religious stuff. So it was republished in 1959. And I think if you can find a copy of that, um, it's been reproduced in Penguin. I'm sure it's translated as well. It's really interesting because it's a personal insight into somebody's mind. And some of the things that Darwin avoids talking about are just as interesting as the things he does talk about. So I think it would give you an insight into what it was like to be Darwin in his own words. So thank you for that question. Thank you. Okay, the next one is João Felipe Tony. João. Hello, Janet. Hello. Thank you very much. It was a very nice portrayal, um, rich portrayal of the backstage uh, from Darwin's work. Um, and it gave me, um, uh, um, or it reinforced some ideas I, I have been thinking about um, related to the notion of evolution or transmutation and in, in to what extent um, Darwin's ideas have um, some kind of uh, um, ideological weight in certain aspects. Um, since you, for example, in your book, you mentioned that the, um, that the main, one of the main aims of, of his, um, rise in the beagle was related by was or was driven by political um military interests mm. and and then you show many of the um, authors that um gave him some background and um, all these together and the fact that um let's say darwin was not the only one who, who was talking about transmutation. So we have many scientists of his time, of that time, in France, in Germany, in, even in, in, in England. So why um, Darwin is like somehow the hero or in, to what extent, uh, how do you see this? Why he is the, um, um, let's say, so celebrated? Wow, that's a fascinating question. I hope you pursue this. So, the people who mostly celebrate Darwin today are living in societies where capitalism is a very strong element 
of their political structure. And we can very confidently look back at Darwin as a member of the Victorian, the 19th century economic expansion of Europe. And although he was, he was politically minded, but in a rather limited sense, you know, he voted, he discussed politics with his friends, he had colleagues who were in Parliament. He considered himself a liberal, and I, I would use the word free thinking, but that has different connotations today. He was a liberally minded individual and all his family was too. And yet his voyage and his books and much of the tradition that emerged after he published were all based on the idea of economic success, competition, and individualism. So when you say that there's an ideological weight to his ideas, you're absolutely right. And you can find texts that discuss this, I think most coherently when people think about social Darwinism, uh, which of course comes much later. I'm not sure if we have a speaker in our series who is going to address this, but I hope we do, uh, because it is important for us now in an era where we're entering, we are in the Anthropocene, we understand some of the things that were completely unavailable to Darwin that he, his work and his writings and his theory emerge in historical context of, of, these, of this political structure. So I look forward to seeing your writings on this. Thank you. Uh, it's a pity, but we won't have another uh, enough class to, to talk about the post-Darwinian period so we will have to 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 have another course to do we'll it. make another course maria yes. <laughs> <laughs> next one marcelo so in our list the next one is natalino de moraes natalino your turn you listen to me yes yeah. i can hear you yes okay thank you for this pose your work for us it's a unique opportunity and great honor uh, first, sorry for my bad English. <laughs> um, one discussion yet common nowadays is about the impact of Darwin's theories for the Christian religions. In chapter one for your book, you say Darwin hasn't given the Bible much credit anymore, but he is never aband abandoning his faith, yes? Uh, my question is about one thing that people don't talk too much in general society. Uh, how has Darwin passed to see his Christian faith after wrote his theory? How, how he translated the two views? Did he still consider himself in Christian? How fascinating. You know, people have asked that question quite a bit, and there's many different answers. So the uh, Darwin himself, didn't think of himself as a Christian. He wrote quite plainly that Jesus you know, the basis of Christianity, he had a rather literal mind. Um, he thought Jesus easily could have existed, but that the resurrection was a nonsense, the virgin birth was a nonsense, um, and that he couldn't go to church and speak the words of the Christian creed. I believe in God, the Father and the Son, all the rest of it. Uh, so he was quite adamant about that, and he lost that element of his faith early on the Beagle voyage. And yet, he was a good, honest, trustworthy, dutiful, loving person 
who did charitable works in his village. He subscribed to anti-slavery movements. He believed in reform in the parliament. He was the kind of person you and I would like to meet. So if we call that Christian, it, it's a little difficult, isn't it? But he certainly did not become a Buddhist or he did not adopt any alternative system. He was what you might call a fallen Christian. Okay. And all of us now in the 21st century, we like to see Darwin as part of the movement away from faith. And we like to see, we like to, to speak as if there was a conflict in the 19th century and that Darwin was a very important element in that conflict. And I think that's right. But the man himself did not engage in conflict. Okay. Thank you. All right, next one is Aurelio. Aurelio Bianco. Well, hello, good morning. Uh, first of all, Janet, uh, thank you so much for the talk. It was wonderful. It was so, so grateful to see. Uh, so my question was about uh, a passage of your talk. Uh, we usually hear, heard about the, the history that uh, Wallace, as you say, made Darwin rush with his publication. Like, oh my God, I, I need to publish this as fast as possible. But when you talk about when you talk about the the differences between the 1844 essay and the origin, I thought like, okay, but he rushed it, but he had some time to make the adjustments and make it some diff. Uh, the, the essays are different. So my my question is, what are the principal differences between the essay and the the origin? And well, <laughs> how was about this time and the history that uh, we heard about in? I don't know, in call it in school. <laughs> so thank you. It's um, a long question to answer, so I will make it short. Um, principally, the differences are conceptual, so that the 1842 and 1844, Darwin had a theory of origins, as he, as you know, he had no theory of genetics. So he believed that the uh, variations emerged from the unsettling of the reproductive systems of organisms when their environment changed. And he principally said in the 42 and 44 essay that these environmental changes were stimulated by geological changes, islands going up and down. He was thinking of the Galapagos archipelago, that an island could have one kind of taught us and it was isolated and any of the changes that emerged would remain fixed in that population and that that would be a new species. So it's a geographical isolation theory. He drops that completely for the origin of species and in the chapter, gosh is it chapter four, um, there's a long discussion that most people avoid reading in the origin of species about how variations can emerge in big populations that are spread widely over a tract of land or a tract of ocean and that there is a principle of divergence at work and so it is the principle of divergence that Darwin develops in the middle of the 1850s that cause him to change slightly this geographical isolationism so that the origin has a rather different theory of how it actually works. Uh, many of us as historians aren't always that interested in, in how it actually works, but modern biologists really are interested in what Darwin had to say about this theory. And most people agree that what he had in the origin is absolutely correct. But some people regret that he lost that very simple isolation and change model. And if you're interested in pursuing this, 
one of the more famous biologists who regretted that Darwin dropped that idea was Ernst Mayer, the American biologist, historian, philosopher. So that's the main difference. And then, of course, as you will know, there are differences between Darwin's theory and Wallace's theory. Uh, and I'm hoping that you have someone in your series who will really talk about Wallace. I know it's not ideal in a course on Darwin to have Wallace, but he helps us understand Darwin. And of course, he's a wonderfully interesting figure in his own right. Imagine coming up with this theory on your own. Um, he was well read, but he didn't have any of the support system that Darwin had. And he was out in the middle of Malaysia. It was just amazing what Wallace did. So I'm glad you introduced him. Wonderful. Yeah, our next guest is Arthur. Arthur José, are you there? Yeah. Uh, okay, I re I read. Yes. Okay. So first of all, thank you for the amazing presentation. Uh, my question is a little bit about that gaps that you said in the when you showed the the tree draw. Yes. And I would like to ask a little bit about the the concept of the extinction play, the 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 role that that extinction mm -hmm. play in the evolutionary process. Was this concept already um, new by Darwin? Uh, was the concept already well established in, in the science community by that time? Because that's the impression I have when you talk about the gaps in the that tree. And I'd like mm -hmm. to say to see if that's correct. Yes. Thank you. Extinction was well accepted by the time Darwin was working on the Beagle Voyage or even beforehand. It had been conclusively established around the year 1800 when Georges Cuvier worked on fossil organisms. So that an individual thinker would have been very unusual if he or she thought that things were not going extinct. And when I spoke about that tree drawing, I'd actually like to see somebody write about this. Why don't you write about this? The lines demarcate spaces in the drawing. And for me, it seems those spaces are what are really interesting because in Darwin's mind, they would have been full of extinct species. So they're not really spaces, they're just, we don't see all those extinct forms. He has um, removed them for the sake of the drawing. So it's, if you can do something fancy digitally, you could bring the spaces up as the focus of the picture and let the lines be dissolved or something. I think it would be really interesting. I think we are in a good position today because we know so much more to really think about that image. There are a couple of rather wonderful books about visualizing the tree of life. And as far as I know, people have focused on the lines and the tree and it's a wonderful metaphor. But don't we think possibly that that's all about us in a way? It's um, the lines take us to the modern day and that we could be really creative by thinking slightly differently about this picture. So thank you for your question. No, thank you, it's amazing answer. Okay, next one is Bernardo. Bernardo Quintão. Where are you, Bernardo? Is Bernardo here? There he is. Yes. Um, first, 
First, I would like to thank you, Janet, for the class, the wonderful class that you just gave us. And my question is about Darwin's personal life before the Beagle. Uh, first, about Erasmus, Erasmus Darwin, his grandfather. Uh, did she? Did he was recognized by the books that he wrote, or he's just like an not so uh, not a big scientist for them at the time he was recognized that's the first question erasmus darwin the grandfather yes 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 uh, was very famous as a writer as an author almost as famous as we might think of Ooh. Richard Dawkins. Um, Erasmus Darwin wrote several big, heavy academic books that nobody read. And then he wrote two popular books that were in the form of poetry, uh, rather simple, rhyming description of life on earth. And one of them goes beyond the origin of life to talk about the origin of human society and culture and technological achievements and the railway train and all kinds of things. So it's a big, long poem that was easy to read and full of triumph of human ingenuity. So it's very popular. So he was famous, yes. He was well, well known for these verses. Um, so if he was so famous, why does uh, Dar Darwin's father was so against that he goes to natural history or do anything but not medicine as the course? Ah. So Darwin's father had very little inheritance himself and had become prosperous under his own efforts as a doctor and he felt that his sons should have a career and that medicine was a profession then that was something gentlemen did. Uh, he, Darwin would have been an intellectual, he could have been a scholar as a doctor, he didn't have to have patients but it was a career pattern that gave a young person a place in British society and a, and a salary without having to work building roads or anything like that. So that Darwin's father was upset that the son would not become a doctor. There was another son, you know, an older brother who did become a doctor. And so the father wanted both his boys to become doctors. I'm sorry, does that really answer you? It's, I think the father wanted to have Charles Darwin established in a professional career that gave him stability and income. Thanks, thanks. Ok, next one, Adriana. Adriana Navarro. Hello, can you see me? Can you hear me? Yes. yes. Yeah. Hello. First of all, thank you so much for being here today. It's an honor to be in a great course and have your presence. And my question is actually a bit different. It's about Charles Lyell. Because mm -hmm. a lot been said and we know a lot how much his book and his work influenced Charles Darwin and how much he even motivated Darwin on publishing and at the same time he it took him a long time to believe or even admit some influence that wasn't divine <laughs> and that wasn't that was uh, in the evolutionary thread of thought and my question for you would be how do you see these controversial uh, ideas on such key concepts of their work? Mm 
Okay. Thank you. That's a very astute point to bring up. Thank you. We can perhaps see Charles Lyell as representative of many people who read and encountered Darwin's theory who found it very difficult. And Lyell went as far as he could in accepting the mechanistic parts of Darwin's theory. He could see that natural selection surely worked in the way that Darwin proposed. He could see, he could even see evolution happening, but he couldn't see Darwin's mechanism accounting for the origin of the human mind, our abilities, our dexterousness, our, uh, our culture. Um, he just couldn't see it. It was a too big a step for him to take. And as you've already said, it was too big a step for him. And isn't that rather like lots of people who encountered Darwin, that they admired Darwin's book, they read it, they took it seriously. Of course, they criticized parts of it, but the heart of it was that we humans are animals. And that was too much for an awful lot of readers. So I think it's a wonderful question. And one could look more closely at Lyle's journals. Um, he worried about this a lot. And for those of you who are going to pursue it, he talked about this with Wallace, because Wallace too eventually found that he thought humans maybe the human mind was something different not subject to natural selection and he and lyle talked about this much later on in the um, 1870s or so but that's a fascinating conversation so a very very helpful question thank you thank you very much okay Professor Janet, I'm going to make a question on behalf of our friend Thais. She wrote it in the chat. And I'm looking for the question. OK. Uh, so Thais made this question. Hello, Professor Brown. Thank you very much for this amazing presentation. It was a really interesting one. We've also read the first chapter of your book, The Origin of Species Biography. And one thing that struck my curiosity was that Darwin seems to have developed at least part of his scientific thinking while in Cambridge. How did science and religion coexist there in Cambridge's environment? Thank you. I don't know if you're listening now or if you're going to uh, catch up with the recording later, but you are with a strong group of historians who believe that Cambridge was really important in Darwin's development. And it was important in lots of different ways. Uh, it was the first time he had been alone and had friends and was enjoying himself doing things he liked doing. But he encountered also many marvelous intellectual minds at Cambridge, and he read a number of important books that helped develop his views. And the general teaching and cultural environment of Cambridge University was that everybody who was a professor had to be a Christian um, signatory. They had to either be a clergyman so that Darwin's professors were all Reverend Henslow, Reverend Hewell, Reverend this, Reverend that, Reverend Sedgwick. They had all taken holy orders and in the summer months when they weren't teaching they went to a church to, to preach. So their convictions were very important for Darwin, that nature, the world around us, is a reflection of God's beneficence, 
that you can see in the natural world the order um, and the um, support that the Christian God gave to human beings. And this was particularly reflected in the book written by William Paley that I mentioned that was on the curriculum or if it wasn't that book it was another very similar book that was on the curriculum that Darwin read and liked. So the, the, the view of most of the young men at the university was that nature was an expression of God's will. So imagine how transformative it must have been for Darwin to pull himself out of that frame of mind and he possibly couldn't have done it without going on the Beagle voyage that took him out of that environment and set him on his own feet asking his own questions trying to find his own answers and he came back from the voyage as a secular thinker so thank you for the question Cambridge was important yes Okay, uh, I think João has another question on behalf of another of our colleagues. Uh, João, are you there? Uh, that will be our last question of this round. Thank you. Okay. Yes, um, Rafaela Maia, she says here she's grateful for your lecture. She really appreciates. And I think uh, her question in somehow was already answered. Uh, just previously, it goes in the same direction, but it's slightly different um, or complements her question. She's saying that in the chapter, the beginning in your book, page 39, there is a um, quotation that without, without Leo, it could be said, it would, would not be possible to have Darwin, nor the intellectual intuition, nor the Beagle's journey as it is known. Um, so then, um, Rafaela, by reading the whole chapter, she noticed that she had the impression that already before this meeting with, with Leo's work, in her point of view, uh, these um, experiences and uh, previous ex experiences and readings were already forming his judgments about uh, transmutation, process of transmutation. So what makes um, so important this reading of Liu uh, to say that this was so crucial? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, both of you, Raffaella. Um, if you think of Darwin's life story as being the amalgamation of the ideas he got from Edinburgh, the ideas he got from Cambridge, and the ideas that he got from Lyle when he was on the Beagle voyage, those three important intellectual traditions mingle and give Darwin a lot of difficult things to think about and in the end he adopts Lyle's point of view but he uses that point of view to answer the questions that he encountered in Cambridge and Edinburgh so it's a, a fascinating and I think very real story of how an intellectual comes to their ideas. Darwin just doesn't, doesn't just walk across an island and have an idea. It's the accumulation of all kinds of puzzlement that he's been working with through, well, let's say 10 years, really, since he was a teenager. So that's a interesting thing. I, I, I myself believe, I, you may find other people in this series have different points of view, that he had a tradition from Edinburgh, a tradition from Cambridge, a, tradi a, a new way of thinking from Lyle, 
and when he came back from the Beagle voyage, he meets, um, or he reads Malthus. So there's all these influences that are working on him. So thank you for the question. Thank you. That's, that's great, Janet. We, we need to uh, I think leave we you <laughs> with some rest. And no, uh, I, I, I want to say thank you, everybody, who has uh, lasted this, this long time to ask me so many interesting questions. I think it's wonderful. I am very appreciative. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, especially for the encouragement you gave these students to continue studying Darwin and the uh, history of biology. So uh, we are really uh, glad to see you today. And I hope we can meet again as soon as the pandemic thing uh, permit. So. Thank you so much, everybody. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Marcello, for helping me with the visuals and for all the attendees, the participants. You've all been so helpful and, and supportive. It's been great to meet you. I hope we meet at some other occasion when we're back to being real people again. Yeah. Um, and I really want to suggest to Maria that next year we have a post-Darwin course. Okay, okay. So you you be my first guest again. <laughs> okay, before we meet, uh, we meet again in half an hour, ten thirty on uh, Discord. And thank you again, Janet. Okay, my pleasure. Bye -bye. Thank you. Everybody. Thank you, Professor Janet. Goodbye. Bye bye. Goodbye.